good afternoon, good evening um, to everyone. Uh, my name is Konrad Pendziviat. Uh, I'm um, together with Dobroslava Viktor Mach uh, leading uh, the Migration um, and Multicultures Observatory. And uh, today, the um, um, seminar will be devoted to the theme of um, international migration and issues of um, tax morale. And we'll have um, great guests with us, uh, uh, Nicola Conilio from Italy. Um, Nicola is an associate professor in economic policy at the University of Bari. Uh, he conducts uh, teaching and research uh, activities uh, around the areas of human capital and development, international trade and uh, uh, factor mobility, uh, the economics of migration, urban and regional economics. Uh, he's an international expert for the UN uh, in Industrial Development Organization with headquarters in Vienna and cooperates with several colleagues based at international and national institutions, including our good friend uh, Jan Brzozowski from Krakow University of Economics. Um, Nicola is uh, an Italian director of Erasmus Mundus Master Program in Economics and Globalization and European Integration, which is run by a consortium of European and non-European universities. Um, he was uh, also awarded uh, with the Epinois Prize for the best paper presented at the European Regional Science Association in 2003 and 4. Um, the second speaker is uh, Jan Brzozowski, who is Associate Professor and the Head of the Department of European Studies and Economic Integration at uh, our university. And he's also a Deputy Director of the CASPAR so Center for Advanced Studies on Population and Religion. Um, he is, uh, his research focuses on economic aspects of international migration, including socioeconomic integration of migrants and returnees, immigrant entrepreneurship, uh, migrant transnationalism. He's published widely in numerous uh, journals, including Entrepreneurship and Regional Development, European Urban and Regional Studies, and Sociologica. I had also a, a pleasure to, to work with Jan closely within um, Migration and Multicultural Observatory, within which this seminar is organized. Um, I don't want to take uh, more time uh, introducing the subject. I think it's the best that the authors do it uh, themselves. So now I pass the floor to Jan and Nicola. And once again, thank you very much for being with us. Information for those who are with us, thank you for joining. And just uh, to, to, uh, to one technical information, as all uh, OVIM seminars, this one is also being recorded and we'll try to um, make it available on our YouTube channel. So all of the people who don't want to have their um, not to appear in this in this video please uh, switch off your um, your cameras the the presentation will last for approximately half an hour and then uh, we'll have a q a during which you will be able to also uh, ask questions directly so thank you very much for joining and nicola Jan, the floor is yours okay um so good afternoon everyone uh, can you see uh, the the first slide of our presentation yes so basically our um, uh, research project and our studies on uh, social remittances um and uh, first of all i would say a few words about why actually uh, studying tax morale and uh, how migration influences tax morale is important in uh, Central and Eastern Europe and especially in Poland. Um, 
and then we will uh, uh, say something about um, our research aim, present the methods, and of course, we will then turn to the results of our empirical analysis. So, um, of course, the question um, why people actually do pay taxes um, is, uh, is being asked uh, by researchers around the globe. But in the Polish case, the situation is somehow special. And this is an explanation for non-Polish audience mostly. Because uh, from its history, Poland has uh, a, a very, um, let's say, complicated past uh, for over uh, 130 years. Uh, Poland was occupied by three powers um, in uh, mostly for the 19th century. Uh, then in the 20th century, after 20 years of independence, it has been occupied by um, Soviets and by, um, by Germans, uh, by uh, Nazis. And later on in the second course of the 20th century, the communist system has been implemented. As the result, for decades and for many generations of Poles, the um, state and its apparatus uh, institutions were not perceived as friendly. Uh, so in the case of um, uh, uh, an attitude towards public goods and towards uh, financing the state by a taxpayer, um, lots of um, avoiding techniques and, and attitudes can be driven by the history of Poland. Uh, and as you can see, data here, which is quite, I would say, staggering, um, in uh, 2000. Five, so basically one year after Poland uh, has uh, became a member of European Union, um, uh, almost half of uh, surveyed uh, Polish respondents um, uh, were actually uh, uh, allowing for uh, some at least degree of uh, tax avoidance. So uh, only 52.2% considered cheating on taxes as never justifiable. Yes, so basically it's um, this um, uh, percentage was surprisingly low for a highly developed economy. But in uh, 2018, so within 14 years, this uh, um, number has jumped substantially to 76.4%. So there is a big improvement in last years when it comes to tax morality. Uh, and now, of course, our job is to find out to which extent actually this change was also Mm, possible uh, because of international migration. Because we know very well from previous research that international migration uh, constitutes a potential channel through which uh, the norms, attitudes, uh, ways of behavior and values can be transmitted from the, uh, the countries in which diaspora is being located to the home country. And um, uh, we, in particular, focus on tax morale and want to, uh, to, uh, to analyze whether actually migration has impacted on tax morality on, uh, of those who stayed in Poland, who didn't migrate, but who had migrants in their households, in their families. Um, and also for non-Polish um, audience, this, uh, the illustrations here are taken from a very uh, well-known for my generation uh, comedy, uh, 
uh, movie uh, Mish, which actually presents communist Poland in uh, uh, funny but quite uh, uh, surprisingly uh, realistic way. And uh, actually, most of the people who behave, who are shown in this, in this movie, show actually very low uh, tax morality and uh, are not very much attached uh, to um, the social norms in this, uh, for instance, pictures. You can see um, traditional Polish uh, peasants who cut uh, the trees in the public forest to sell it, to, um, to exchange it for coal uh, to the, um, to the um, uh, some 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 workers who actually stole the coal from from the factory and went to the countryside to trade it with the with the peasants. So as you can see, of course, this is a fictional story. However, this uh, tradition of um, uh, maybe not stealing, but not seeing in uh, stealing by somebody. Um, uh, something which is public as necessarily something which is very evil, which is very bad, is somehow embodied in um, Polish tradition. But in recent uh, two decades of the independence, this fortunately has been uh, improved in Polish society. And when it comes to research on um, tax morale and social remittances, the whole story starts with um, traditional studies who based the assumptions of human beings uh, on homo economicus paradigm. And of course, they failed to actually explain why uh, so many people evade taxes, why so many people do not pay taxes, and uh, actually free rights on public goods in many countries of the world. That's why. The economists who, st who studied tax morale decided to turn into some other determinants of tax morality, uh, looking at, uh, for instance, ethnic and linguistic diversity of the society. And this is particularly uh, visible in the field of behavioral economics, which has convincingly demonstrated uh, that actually social interactions play a key a pivotal role in uh, determining individuals' tax morale. Uh, see, for instance, the latest paper of Maciej Gurecki and Natalia Letki in Journal of B uh, Business Ethics, in which they um, uh, analyze tax morality in uh, a number of Central and European uh, countries. However, these studies, of course, do not fully account for migration. And migration, as we know very well uh, from migration studies and also from the history, um, uh, can uh, um, serve as a process who, who actually make radical changes in uh, the society. Um, uh, so migrants can be somehow uh, transmitters of new norms uh, values, ways of behavior to their home uh, countries. Um, in a traditional vision presented by Peggy Levitt, uh, social remittances uh, are usually understood as ideas, norms of behavior, uh, and cultural practices that somehow are imported from usually more developed host countries to migrants' countries of origin. Uh, here, just a few pictures to illustrate, of course, that social remittances were somehow invented, yes, by social anthropologists, but they are anything but a new concept. In fact, we know from uh, history of various countries, including Poland, but also Israel, that migrants constituted a very important channel of uh, um, uh, transmission of norms, uh, democratic values. Uh, so for instance, Polish independence in 1918 and reinstallation of democracy was possible because of very active diaspora engagement, 
the same goes for uh, the uh, um, uh, origins of Israel as a nation state and involvement of Jewish diaspora and many other countries contemporary can also serve as example and uh, Moldova uh, which is the let's say most recent example of such uh, political transmission in which uh, diasporans play at least a substantial role. So basically now what we see in recent years, the gradual Europeanization of Moldovan society uh, and um, um, uh, Michel uh, uh, Bain and Hillel Rapoport have demonstrated convincingly that um, these changes uh, at least partially occur because of uh, the uh, migrants who reside in uh, Western Europe and who transmit democratic values to Moldova. For Poland, the studies on social remittances are uh, quite numerous. Um, in recent years, we have witnessed that uh, we, we could see lots of studies uh, which are involved about social practices, but most of them are conducted at a local, not national level, and are based on uh, qualitative approaches. Therefore, the generalizations from these studies are um, rather impossible. So they just show, uh, let's say, a fraction of a Polish reality. Why, in our case, we want to um, find the results uh, of the evidence for uh, social remittances at the national representative level. So going to uh, the core, uh, so to our um, research aim, uh, we want to analyze the effect of international migration on tax morale or uh, speaking more broadly on individual attitudes and norms towards the contribution to the financing of public goods in Poland. And our hypothesis, a very general one, is that um, socially accepted norms of behavior in Poland can change when a member of the household is exposed, is exposed through migration to alternative norms of behavior. So those who prevail in the host country. Now, when it comes to methods and data overview, uh, I will pass uh, the floor to Nicola. Thanks a lot, Jan, and uh, thanks uh, to everybody, to Conrad for the nice introduction and to all of you uh, that are uh, listening to us and uh, gave us this important opportunity to present our work. Um, so Jan was um, describing what is our um, no main research uh, uh, aim. Uh, I will spend some time on um, uh, what are the, ingre the ingredients that we use and a little bit the, the, the recipe that we use to test the, uh, the hypothesis and the, uh, that Jan was uh, uh, nicely illustrating. So what we do, we use um, uh, a, a database, which is known as a social di diagnosis. It's a very interesting uh, database and quite unique, I would say, in terms of for, for uh, um, scholars in migration study, because uh, it's a, a, as a panel dimension uh, and is representative of Polish society between 2003 and 15. So it's uh, basically, there are several uh, biannual waves. Uh, in particular, we use five waves uh, from 2007 to 2015 because they started to collect information on uh, current migration experience from 2007, unfortunately. But still, this is a very interesting period um, uh, for uh, investigating out migration because Poland uh, was started to be and still uh, is uh, the most important sending country in Europe and uh, one of the most important in the world. It's a, a quite interesting also uh, migration uh, uh, experiment because it because of the massive migration that uh, was associated with uh, uh, the process of integration in the European Union. 
Uh, the data, social diagnosis contains uh, uh, several, uh, it's a very rich uh, database, not only on uh, the characteristics of uh, Polish society, but also uh, it collects the information on uh, social attitudes, uh, norms, and, um, uh, and also, as I said, from 2007, the uh, migration experience at the household level. Uh, Jan, if you can go to the next one. Okay, so what we do, um, we focus on uh, uh, what, as Jan said, are called uh, uh, social remittances. And we look in particular at the stayers. So those individuals within the family that were no movers uh, for at least um, uh, two survey, as I will say in a while, um, and uh, belonged to household uh, where they were members uh, uh, currently residing abroad. So what is, uh, I think, unique uh, um, in our study, I mean, there are several studies uh, which are using uh, um, a panel dimension uh, in order to identify the true effect of uh, 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 migration. Uh, what is interesting is the combination of between the, this panel dimension and uh, uh, information on uh, um, uh, social belief. Uh, which I think it's quite unique and allows us to uh, investigate as a unit, uh, the, the basic unit of analysis in our study are individuals within household. And uh, uh, we are able to exploit the within household uh, dimension. Um, so basically we use uh, a methodological approach where we have uh, uh, fixed effects. So we are able to, to control for all those time invariant characteristics of individuals which might affect both their propensity to migrate, but also their, their in, in general, their at attitudes. Uh, what is our main dependent variable? So we use uh, uh, several alternatives, uh, uh, three indexes in particular. The first one, uh, which we call social benefit misuse, it, it's basically capturing the aversion of individuals uh, toward the exploitation of the welfare system. Um, so basically, the, the, the question that is asked is, uh, uh, do you, uh, how much do you care if someone pays, uh, uh, if, if someone unjustly obtains unemployment benefit? It, it's a categorical uh, um, variable going from minimum not caring at all, which is equal to one, to a maximum which is four caring at all. The second variable we also use to capture a slightly different dimension of uh, uh, free riding. It's a generic question on uh, uh, dislike of uh, tax avoidance. Um, so this is compared to, if you want, compared to the previous uh, measure, while the first one the exploitation of uh, the welfare system and in particular unemployment uh, benefit it's something that is capturing uh, free riding from the bottom part of the income distribution as typically uh, this uh, you know, exploitation in this sense abuse of the welfare system will, will come from uh, uh, less wealthy individuals on the contrary tax avoidance is generally perceived as a, a, a free riding from the top part of the income distribution. The third measure has a more local twist or in terms of free riding, which is uh, ticket avoidance. So what uh, it's basically how much individual dislike if individuals are abusing or not paying for uh, tickets for local transport or the uh, local public goods. Uh, we also combine these three indexes into one, which we call the public good. So it's a, a generic measure in our opinion on uh, uh, the intensity of uh, cooperative norms uh, for individuals. Um, if you can go to the next one. Okay, so this is what we estimate in particular. Um, so the, uh, our variable, dependent variable is one of these four uh, categorical variable I was just mentioning. Uh, our main covariate of interest uh, is a dummy which is equal one when from one wave of the panel to the next one, that is migration within the family. So it's basically the uh, main identification of our shock uh, to the uh, 
to social norms. Uh, we also control for a set of uh, uh, time variant characteristics of individuals and their, their families. Uh, and we, as I said, we include the uh, fixed effect at the individual level. So basically, it's, uh, uh, the estimation is akin to what economists call uh, difference in difference estimations, uh, uh, because basically we are these, these, the, the parameter B1 in this uh, equation that we are presenting here, it's basically capturing the effect of uh, our, no, the shock of international migration on uh, the dependent variable. So it, we interpret, we can interpret this beta one as basically the effect of uh, migration within the family on attitudes toward uh, free riding. Um, we do a set of, uh, if you can go to the next one, Jan, thank, thanks. We, um, we isolate, we include only individuals who have, in order to, um, uh, to avoid the bias that can be associated with uh, um, the uh, self selection of, of uh, individuals. So, so we restrict uh, the analysis to those, of course, that have been interviewed at least in two consecutive waves. They have never migrated in the past, and none uh, from uh, uh, their household had migrating in the previous uh, period. We also conduct, we don't have time to, to show here, but we do a battery of uh, robustness tests and also some tests. Uh, for potential attrition bias that is typical in this kind of uh, study. Uh, just to give you an idea on the summary statistics. Um, so the, um, um, we, uh, more or less, we, there are three to 4% uh, of the observation of the observation in which we have uh, uh, migrants uh, within the family. Uh, we control for the household sites. This is very important because per se migration is a shock to the sites of households, which might be one driver of our results. Um, and we include a dummy variable where the individuals uh, gets married or there are some changes in the composition of the household. Uh, gender, education, and uh, um, change in the employment status. Uh, we control for also growth at the, the uh, local level by including uh, regional uh, uh, GDP per capita and uh, change in the income of the family. Uh, so I will leave uh, to Jan again for uh, presentation of the main results, and then I will take the floor again. Jan. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, so in the, the very first uh, table, table two, that I will show in a few seconds, we uh, report the most general uh, results. Uh, please note that we uh, can differentiate between the dummy effect. So basically whether in the household we have any migration in an analyzed period. And also we can control the number of migrants in the household. Uh, so we can actually check if uh, the effect uh, is somehow differentiated when we have more than one migrant and so in the household. So we have a, a, from columns five to eight that we will see, we will have also a continuous variable on a migration. And um, Jan, maybe uh, you can put full screen so that. Uh, uh, oh, I can do it. Uh, I think it is full screen. Yeah, this is okay. this is already. Yeah, different. it is full screen. Yes. It just it yeah. just shows like this. So um, <sighs> it should be. Okay, the animation doesn't work properly. So as you can see, um, the, the, the most important result is displayed in this box. Uh, so basically the presence of migrants in the household uh, affects all of the four um, uh, indexes and uh, dependent variables we are using. So. Uh, both uh, social benefits misuse, tax avoidance, ticket avoidance, and 
the composite measure of public uh, good. Um, and uh, the, the effect is uh, quite significant, at least at 5% uh, level, with maybe the exception of the ticket avoidance, which is at 10%. Um, what is also uh, important is um, the question of, so we, we actually were wondering and we, we, uh, with the fixed effect, we, we couldn't fully uh, control for it. Uh, that's why we also have run some um, robustness checks because for uh, Polish, uh, let's say audience, this might be um, rather obvious that we should also check if um, the regional uh, location of the household makes sense. Of course, this is partially controlled through the regional GDP, but also we, uh, in uh, the specifications which use um, uh, uh, random effects, uh, we were also testing for uh, the city location and for Eastern Poland. And of course, this, uh, these controls proved to be uh, obviously uh, significant um, in a negative way. So um, the Eastern Poland is traditionally much more conservative, resilient, uh, not, not, not fully ready to change. Uh, nevertheless, in all, after controlling for this location, still the effect of migration is positive for all of the households. And now when uh, we include the number of migrants in each household, the results are more or less similar, maybe with the exception of the ticket avoidance, which becomes insignificant, but other uh, three variables of interest uh, for other three dependent variables, the effect of uh, migration is still uh, strong and significant and positive. So in the case of um, um, so the basic fun finding from, from this uh, estimation from, uh, from this uh, first uh, bunch of results is that we uh, have uh, indeed uh, found an evidence for social remittances in um, the households who have migrants. So for those who do not move, but have at least one migrant in the household, their attitudes uh, towards um, public goods and towards tax morality uh, improve over time because of uh, the transmission of norms from migrants who reside abroad. But of course, this is a very general result. So now Nicola will uh, analyze in detail what actually matters in this uh, transmission of norms. Thanks, Jan. So basically, we asked ourselves uh, the following question. Uh, migration is uh, potentially changing uh, uh, behavioral norms for the reason that were discussed in, uh, you know, in, the, in the motivation of this study by, by Jan, um, because it, it's changing several elements that are uh, likely to affect the um, pro-social behavior in general and, and uh, tax morale and aversion toward free riding in general. And uh, basically, there are two main uh, reason why uh, no, behavioral, uh, no, tax behavior might change. Now, the first one uh, is related to the uh, socioeconomic context. Um, we know that um, from behavioral studies that a, a, a sizable share of uh, uh, tax norms, uh, they do not depend on intrinsic preferences of individuals, but they, but they are shaped by the context in which individuals live. Uh, the social context and the, the prevailing norms. Now, if you live in, in, uh, in a society where uh, um, tax avoidance is considered as the norm, um, your, uh, uh, no, th there is no uh, shame or uh, fairness consideration that will, ke will keep you uh, deviating from this norm. So migration is changing by uh, 
in modifying the context in which the migrants live indirectly, but also directly is also changing the environment uh, and the context in which also those who are left behind lives. But although migration is opening this bridge between um, the host country and um, the, uh, uh, the destination country, whether you will walk this, uh, this bridge and what you will carry uh, from, uh, uh, from one side to the other really depends on who is migrating and also who remains. So this is basically what we ask in the, um, uh, in the second step of our analysis. So we uh, test the hypothesis whether the characteristics, uh, the characteristics of the migrant uh, first uh, and uh, or those that are left behind matters in this gen in explaining this general finding you now whether we find some heterogeneity in terms of the transmission of social norms and interestingly um, what we find is that uh, first of all it really depends on who lives and in particular we find evidence that uh, uh, these uh, type of social remittance, uh, um, it's manifesting itself only when uh, younger and more educated individuals are living. This is what you see in, uh, in the current slide. So um, uh, when neither the uh, household head or partner, which are typically older and less educated are those who migrate. But actually the strong and the significant effect is associated to migration of uh, young and highly educated individuals. Um, gender also matters. Uh, we find evidence that uh, uh, the effect is strong when male are migrating. Uh, this is quite interesting in the context of migration study in, the, in, in general uh, quite uh, astonishingly in the, well, it, it's a small literature on uh, social remittances. Uh, there are very few investigation of heterogeneous effect. While uh, if we look at uh, financial remittances, the literature is telling us that uh, it really depends who is living. For instance, you know, we know from study by Ricardo Faini that uh, uh, high-skilled individuals are, are less likely to, um, to send financial remittances. In general, female uh, are more likely to send uh, remittance, and when they remit, they also remit more than male individuals. Uh, in terms of tax morale, we find um, that it's uh, the strongest effect is associated to male migration. This might be due uh, to the fact that uh, uh, not necessarily by uh, difference, uh, uh, gendered intrins intrinsic difference, but this might be explained by the different, uh, the heterogeneity in terms of opportunities that uh, Poles migrants have abroad. So it's a difference in the social context uh, surrounding migration because of uh, probably, you no, know, we are speculating here, different professional path uh, between male Poles uh, abroad and female Poles abroad. In the uh, last step of the analysis, we look at the other side on those who stay. This is in table five, which is the next one, uh, which is also telling us something uh, we believe very important and very interesting. The effect is uh, uh, very strongly significant uh, um, when those who stay put are uh, relatively older and less educated. Why be, we believe this is very important? Uh, because actually this is precisely the stratum of the population which has a priori the lowest degree of tax morale. So as the highest tolerance toward the free riding in a society. So it seems that uh, international migration is shaping social norms in particular for those who most need it in terms of uh, boosting pro-social uh, behavior. Um, so basically, just to uh, summarize, because I think we take uh, more or less uh, the time that um, it was given to us. So this is one of the uh, few study, well, in, in our, to our knowledge, is the first study in this small literature on social remittances that uh, uh, contribute attitudes in terms of contribution to public goods in general and free riding. 
uh, we find that this uh, indeed international migration is affecting uh, this um, channel, which might uh, induce a positive transformation of uh, uh, home society. Um, we also um, we did some, uh, 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 although we have not time to show it here, but we did a placebo test in order to understand whether what we find is uh, associated to international migration and not to other change in the composition of the household, for instance, because of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the marriage of someone or the death of some uh, component of the, the family or other types of uh, absence from the household, which has nothing to do with international migration. And actually, our results strongly confirm that what we find is associated to international migration. We also find uh, an effect of internal migration on uh, uh, some of the dependent variables, suggesting in particular those on, uh, on uh, um, uh, tax avoidance, the most general uh, form of um, uh, tax morale. So, um, so the, the, the finding is, as I said, is particularly relevant uh, uh, because of uh, the heterogeneity in the effect and then in a, in a, in form of heterogeneity, which is uh, suggesting a very important role of uh, international migration in, uh, in uh, shaping uh, uh, contribution to public goods. Uh, I think I will stop here. And um, uh, I think I have anticipated the next slide, Jan. So basically, if you don't have anything else to add, I no, will stop no worries. Here and take... uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the, um, so uh, just to recapitulate the main findings, um, definitely we find evidence for uh, social remittances, and that it's a, in a and it's a positive effect on tax morale in Poland. Um, but we have to uh, keep in mind that uh, remittances uh, are somehow dependent on uh, both those who live and those who stay. So the best uh, transmitters of social norms back to the home country, in our case, are the youngest and more educated uh, persons from the household. Uh, then, uh, of course, as Nicola said, the ones who are most affected are the uh, oldest and least educated persons within the household, which is actually good because those people on average tend to be, uh, let's say, less um, uh, uh, or more tolerant to free riding and uh, not necessarily so more, more moralic in terms of tax avoidance. Um, but um, the, the, the point is um, how we can actually um, uh, tell about the potential of the results for the entire region. This is something that needs uh, uh, some reservation. So our findings, we believe, are... Uh, of course, a representative for Polish economy and Polish economy only. Although, of course, we believe that in other countries, post-communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe, also the impact of social remittances uh, is important and uh, is significant. Um, the problematic issue is, um, and this is something that um, is a limitation of our study and is, a, I think, a very good avenue for further research, is uh, the investigation on the effect of um, the, uh, the destination country. So in our case, uh, most of uh, Polish migrants migrated to Western Europe uh, members of European uh, Union, yes? So in this case, these countries, although they have, of course, some variation when it comes to culture, uh, they are very much homogeneous when it comes to tax morality. Uh, so uh, it would be extremely interesting 
to investigate uh, the, um, the impact of destination countries in, the, in, the, in, in, in uh, situations when the destination countries are very much different when it comes to tax morality. An, an obvious candidate would be Moldova, obviously. But not only, uh, I think Belarusia is also a very good candidate for such uh, analysis. Um, so this is this is the let's say um, uh, the the thing that we have not considered in our study. Of course, we did try to uh, to look for the the importance of the destination country, but admit, we have to admit that uh, the results were not significant and uh, were not meaningful uh, to show them here. So basically. Uh, uh, and we explain, we, we provide the explanation that the differences cannot be seen because probably the um, destination countries are very uh, much similar in this regard. So this is something that should be analyzed further uh, and obviously uh, in other countries of Central and Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, so basically summing up, just wanted, I just wanted to recapitulate that uh, we are very happy about this study because it actually shows a very positive thing and a thing which is very often underestimated by policymakers that uh, when we look for really positive and profound changes made by international migration, this is the most uh, likely option. So um, uh, migrants uh, can uh, contribute to modernization, democratization uh, of um, the society from which they come from through social remittances. And this is a very positive message we uh, hopefully de uh, um, deliver with our study. Okay, so... Um, I think this is all we would like to share with you. Uh, of course, we look forward for some comments, questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jan and Nicola, for presenting this fascinating uh, study. Um, I'd like now to open Q and A. Uh, so just um, switch on your mic or raise your hand. So or write on chat so <clears throat> your question to Jan and Nicola. And while waiting for the questions to emerge, um, I'll, um, I'll have uh, a few of my own um, to start off the discussion. Um, I, I couldn't see if you could explain a little bit. I, uh, I, I didn't see properly in your data what was actually the number of uh, migrants uh, in the samples um, of uh, social diagnosis? This is one question. Another question is, what is another alternative source of data after this uh, research was stopped, where you have uh, searched for some newer data uh, on this issue? Uh, second question. Third question, um, how could you make it clearer for me? Because I don't fully grasp it in your tables. What are the, the other reasons uh, and how could you in a way um, distill the other reasons that make people more uh, uh, to, to, to free ride less when it comes to tax? Uh, especially when you nicely show this difference in the data from 2007 to 2015. Uh, and I can imagine many other reasons that make people, and how could you show it uh, in, uh, in, in your database? Uh, another uh, fourth would be the question about the, the sectors of economy as well. You, Jan mentioned very importantly the destination countries are super important when it comes to creation of the uh, of the certain norms those paying taxes and i here i imagine as well that the destination 
varies between, for example, those who went to the UK uh, and those who went to Italy and returned from Italy uh, to just give the, I, I think that there, there is a diversity of opinion. I'm not a tax expert at all, but I imagine there is a, there is a significant difference between the two countries. And uh, so, so the migrants would have different approaches. And the most, I think more importantly, is the sector of economy. As we know in Poland, even now, the latest report has shown, there's a huge number of people that in certain sectors of economy uh, work without uh, paying taxes and without uh, having, uh, well, proper uh, contracts. Uh, one of the sectors which is super important when it comes to migration uh, is the construction sector. Uh, in Poland, this sector uh, is one of the one of these uh, sectors of economy where you find uh, uh, very frequently people working without any contracts. Um, and I wonder to what extent um, the experience of, 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 of working without a contract possibly also uh, uh, abroad is, is really changing someone's uh, uh, opinion, attitude towards tax in, in the country. So just a few, uh, a few questions to start off. Maybe, maybe I can start with uh, formal issues regarded to, to, to data and then Nicola will answer the most general things. Okay, so first of all, it's around, in each wave we have around 1,000 few hundreds uh, migrants. Um, uh, of course, it's depending on wave. Um, um, so as we have around 50,000 or 60,000 almost households uh, in, uh, so uh, in, mo in most cases, this is one migrant per, per household. There are very few mi uh, households from which more than one person actually migrates. And um, this means that we have around 2,000, 2,000, um, migrants per wave, more <laughs> or less, of course. Uh, second issue, unfortunately, um, uh, Polish uh, diagnosis, uh, uh, so Polish social diagnosis has been discontinued because of political reasons. This is something uh, very sad because I would say that um, uh, the most recent data would benefit any political party that is in uh, government. Uh, irrespectively of their political opinions, uh, but this is the fact. So, uh, of course, there are some potentials uh, for um, for conducting such uh, uh, um, such research in future using BIL data, for instance, like uh, label for surveys, but not necessarily for. Um, for households who have migrants in this uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in the household, but rather for 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 uh, for immigrants who are in Poland. Uh, but this is a let's say um, a story for the future, more or less. Uh, uh, for now, uh, uh, with regret, I have to say uh, we don't have uh, any. Uh, replacement for social diagnosis, and this is a. Uh, uh, a huge blow, I would say, for um, social research in Poland because social diagnosis, although maybe its panel format was not necessarily, <laughs> this is an euphemism, of course, uh, what was not necessarily very well described. We took um, a long time to harmonize it into panel, but the quality of data was uh, very high um, and actually um, with this data, uh, lots of Polish researchers could conduct really uh, numerous studies on various topics, not necessarily on migration issues. So this is, uh, 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 it's a shame it has ended like this. Nicola, when it comes to other questions, please. Yes, yes, I will comment also on your last, um... Um, your your uh, appreciation of the social di 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 diagnosis. I when the, the first time I uh, I saw the the data and the, the questionnaire, uh, it, it it it's really a gold mine for social scientists in terms of the information, the depth of information that you have. 
Then, of course, as Jan said, we started to work on you know, cleaning the data and uh, putting them the different waves together. That, that took really a huge investment of time. And then we understood why this gold mine was uh, un so underexploited. Um, uh, so I think there are still a lot of uh, potentially interesting questions that can be answered also in terms of, uh, you know, broadly speaking, what we presented today. For instance, something that we are planning is to look at uh, how the behavior of returnees is affected by um, uh, migration. Because that, what is interesting is that for a subsample of people, you know uh, their social attitude before migration and then after when they, when they, they came back to, uh, to Poland. Now, in this paper, we look at those who stay but it, it's equally interesting to look at how uh, different uh, no, the migration experience, uh, no, what, what kind of effect has induced on uh, several uh, outcomes, like also trust in, uh, on the government and many other things. Um, in terms of new data, what will be ideal also to answer some of uh, your question, Conrad, uh, will be a database in which you are able to look at uh, the migration experience, because one of the limits of our analysis is that actually we don't know what uh, precisely they were doing. Now, clearly, we can do some speculation in terms of uh, uh, trying to explain some, some of our results. Now, for instance, why we find that uh, you know, um, household ad uh, that are uh, older and, pro and maybe migrated in the UK or in Scandinavia, we don't really find any effect on uh, those uh, who um, were left behind. Probably this has to do with the sector of the economy in which they are employed. No, it, it's more likely that if you are a construction worker in, uh, no, in somewhere in Norway, you are basically well, you are basically not exposed to the host uh, uh, country because you don't speak the language. You are working on a construction building uh, from morning till, uh, till uh, dusk. And basically the channel we are pointing uh, out in terms of potential, this potential bridge that is bringing back you know, some uh, uh, pro-social norms simply does not exist in some cases. While if you are an engineer or if you are a young student uh, in the city of London, but even in Milan or in, uh, in Vienna, and you are exposed uh, to uh, uh, host country institution, you see, for instance, why, you know, you start to realize, okay, that's why people pay taxes, no? because you get all these public services and uh, uh, the, the, the quality of, uh, of um, the institution are also associated be with uh, tax morale in general. So this is something that it will be great, uh, but unfortunately with uh, this database, it's not possible to, um, uh, to really dig into this important issue that is the, the, the type, how your migration experience is affecting uh, behaviors and performance. Uh, uh, and this is something that actually we started our cooperation by looking precisely at this. You know, one paper, which is um, called the bitter return. You know, we look at how the migration experience uh, affected the outcome of returnees in terms of reintegration in, uh, in Polish economy and society. Uh, so this is something we are not able to, to control and to look at um, what is determining free riding? Well, the, uh, basically there are uh, two, uh, broadly speaking, two sets of elements. One is related to uh, you know, what Jan was describing as the homo economicus uh, you know, framework. And basically this is, a, you know, the, the according to this framework, whether you are uh, free riding or no, evading your taxes really depends on a cost benefit analysis. So what are the chances that you are caught uh, and uh, how much you gain by, uh, no, by uh, avoiding uh, to pay a ticket on the bus or uh, rather than uh, paying taxes. So when things that are affecting these cost benefit um, implicit calculation are changing, also your tax morale is changing according to the literature. For instance, one of the elements is income that you know, we are controlling uh, 
the most complex and but also the most interesting things that are affecting uh, tax morale in general are uh, other kind of socioeconomic dynamics, uh, in particular interaction in within the society. One important element that, that has been uh, uh, highlighted is the, for instance, trust in uh, government and local institution. Now, of course, you, know, you will uh, be more inclined to pay taxes in a country where you know that your taxes will be put in a good use. Uh, so this uh, clearly, you know, also might be an indirect way through which migration might affect your tax morale. No, you, know, you might change your opinion in terms of trusting the institution and trusting the government. Um, and uh, yes, the, the, the last comment I wanted to make is uh, on the destination card. This is, uh, as Jan said, is, uh, it's uh, something that so far in the paper is, is missing in our analysis. One reason why uh, we don't find much is uh, was um, uh, suggested by Jan because basically the, the migration experience of Polish people is rather homogeneous in terms of destination country. They are mostly Western European country. Although, well, as you said, you know, the U UK and Italy might differ uh, no, from, a stereo no, from a stereotypes. No, I was actually yes reading yesterday um, the comment of a colleague who was saying that uh, he left uh, Italy 20 years ago, going in, uh, in, in, he lives in the UK and saying that when I left, uh, no, Italy was uh, a country perceived as uh, you know, very corrupt, but at least there were, was half of the population who was really uh, you know, against these, uh, you know, these uh, social equilibria. And he was saying, now I am in the UK, which is as corrupt as Italy, but there is not, I, I cannot see that half of the population which is uh, you know, fighting against the status quo. And I have to say that if you look at many dimensions, uh, unfortunately, there was a big convergence in, uh, in, um, in this respect. But well, uh, the, the reason I think, the true reason why we don't really find the strong evidence is related to our um, you know, methodological framework. You know, we are using a fixed effect uh, approach. So uh, most of, part of the self-selection that you would expect in terms of destination is already in our framework. So that we don't find an additional effect of the destination when controlling for a rich set of characteristics of individuals which is kind of expected. I'm, I'm pretty sure we will find something different if we had information on, uh, uh, for instance, what, what people are doing in the destination country. That, that, that's a big, uh, no, something that it would be uh, ideal in our study, but unfortunately it's an information that we, we simply don't, don't have at the moment. Thank you very much, Carl. Any other question, Christoph? Well, okay, I can ask about this gender effect that you said it's uh, was kind of surprising for you and uh, um, you basically make hypothesis, but uh, there is no like evidence and and um, precise explanation what makes this uh, this effect stronger in the case of males. So I was wondering whether, for instance, you were considering um, the well the job um, the economic sectors that uh, women. Um, more are more likely maybe to work when you when you speak of the countries you, you are analyzing like for instance the service sector yes which is kind of a popular sector for women uh, Polish women when they go to many western countries and as we know that in in this sector it's very like more likely to have a job which is let's say in gray zone than than when you are employed by a company and uh, did, did you did you think of, of uh, looking at the at, at the jobs like comparing men and women like whom who migrate and trying to find some some explanation in, in this sector, yeah. Well, uh, maybe I will start. Uh, as, as we already acknowledged, uh, we have um, uh, in the sample, we have very good information on the profession and education of uh, an individual but only in Poland. So basically you can derive information on the country 
of migration only exposed when migrant returns. And uh, there is a very limited uh, data on individual questionnaire when it comes to um, uh, uh, one's professional experience during the migration. Um, so unfortunately, it is almost impossible to do so. What we could do, we could actually try to, let's say, uh, select, that would be uh, an obvious candidate, to select um, females who are migrants and who have um, uh, nursing education. So these would be potentially candidates for Badante or for other caregivers in Italy or Germany. And we could try to isolate their effect. But I seriously doubt this would be an issue because they are not that numerous to make an effect. Um, uh, so um, this is this is a this is a problematic issue. Uh, uh, you are probably right, uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, well, yes, uh, I was thinking about this Italian uh, this uh, these Italian ladies working, uh, these ladies working in Italy uh, in the care uh, sector with the elderly, let's say in Lombardy. Um, but on the other hand, we know from, uh, from other studies that um, on average, uh, females who leave Poland are younger and better educated than males. So uh, this works in opposite direction and, that, and they should be, let's say, uh, um, a typical innovators in the, in the understanding of uh, Cheras uh, typology of returnees, so return of innovation. So uh, anticipating the return, they should be trying to change the, their, their closest environment, including the household. So um, there is a bit uh, of um, contradiction here. Um, um, definitely, we have not enough uh, data to make this explanation possible. Fully, fully yeah, it's a topic for yeah for, for the future. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's it, it's interesting because it, it, as I said, it goes uh, to some extent in uh, in contradiction with the findings on financial remittances. But uh, the most likely explanation is the one you were pointing out. But uh, as I said, uh, we unfortunately we don't know what uh, uh, they are doing abroad. Uh, actually, something that uh, we might uh, try to test uh, now that you, 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 know, you, you make the question, I was thinking about that, whether we still have a gender defect when we, we um, focus on uh, the most highly educated individuals, hmm? because then you would expect that in terms of uh, profession abroad that will be more uh, homogeneous and more likely to have uh, um, to live abroad in a context in which uh, so social interaction are quite intense. Uh, on the contrary, if you are uh, you know, poorly educated, most likely you are ending up in, uh, in uh, an environment where you have limited contact with the host country population. So this is something that we can try to test whether you know, interacting the two dimension, uh, 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 educational level and gender, we still have um, you know, such a striking difference. It will be, will point toward the explanation you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Christophe. Uh, thank you. Just recall by the moderator, I, I feel obliged just to ask the question. Um, I know, gentlemen, that you are experts in uh, migration studies, so if you don't mind, I will ask a much broader question, especially to Nicola, uh, because, you know, Poland is a very uh, specific country, uh, very homogeneous, uh, very monolith, very, very unitarian, very conservative, uh, unicultural, I would even say. And um, my question is about your perception uh, about the migration policy in Poland, uh, which is totally defragmented. But uh, do you think that um, Poland should follow uh, the ways um, how Western um, countries in Europe currently 
um, deal with the migrations or we should um, uh, totally um, create something uh, new? That's, that's a very tough question, I would say, Christoph. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, there is no general policy that uh, the you know, EU, other EU countries are following. No, we have actually, that, that's quite, I think it's, a, it, I've been writing these also in, uh, you know, in, in other contribution that it's, uh, it's a, that we have a big asymmetry in the, in the construction of Europe where we have a common, uh, no, common policy on many things, uh, a single market, so the full mobility, at least uh, you know, very low barrier to mobility within uh, our borders, and uh, 28 different doors through which people are allowed in Europe. No, so, so there is no, uh, well, although there, was a, there is a convergence in terms of the strictness of policy, you know, we are you know, slowly, well, not, we, are, we have moved in, uh, to a, an equilibrium in which uh, paradoxically, um, uh, although academia is showing the benefit of migration, uh, in in an almost in a consensual way, uh, but policy is going uh, in the opposite direction. Of course, there, there are you know, several explanations which are behind economics is more you know, in, uh, in the social context that is driving migration policy rather than the economics of migration. Um, so I, I think um, uh, my opinion is that we should all converge uh, toward a, a model of migration which uh, reopens uh, legal uh, gateways to, to migration. This is something that uh, you know, in almost our country, in Italy in particular, I would say, you know, we have closed uh, all most of the legal channels to, to uh, in, uh, migration. And the, con the only consequence is that Migrants will uh, will arrive anyway, uh, but uh, mostly in uh, illegal way. So basically, you close the door and uh, and they jump from the window simply because the economy needs it. Uh, in particular, Italy, but Pol Poland is not that far away in terms of we have a demographic demographic crisis that is uh, screaming for more people to come. And in this, in this, uh, and Poland is going through a similar dynamics. Maybe you are just a little bit uh, behind us in, in this crisis, but um, I believe that it's um, uh, it will be very important for uh, for Europe to move toward a common approach on migration. If, if we go, if everybody goes in a different way, it's going to be uh, really another another problematic issue of uh, European integration. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it was a very tough one, and I, I tried to divert. <laughs> to thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, for the question and uh, and for Nicola for the answer. Uh, Jan, do you want to add something here, or what do you think it's? Uh... I think we are still in a, uh, just commenting on what Nicola said. Uh, we are still on a very, in Poland, on a very comfortable uh, situation when it comes to migration management. Um, and we are not appreciating it enough um, because uh, for Poland, we have received, uh, um, I would say the cream of the cream uh, when it comes to migrants. And uh, so we have uh, mostly received uh, young, well-educated Ukrainians and Belarusians, which are uh, not only keen to work, uh, and but I but I very but are very uh, similar in cultural terms. Uh, but uh, I think it's a matter of time when we will be uh, forced to receive uh, involuntary migrants. And uh, this is a completely different story and also illegal migrants on a much bigger scale than it's uh, being, uh, it's taking place right now. So um, that's why uh, we are not so much sympathetic in Poland, not only when it comes to politicians, but also to 
general public to Italian or Spanish calls to adopt a unified uh, migration policy for Europe. Unfortunately, we probably will need uh, a blow, uh, some um, external shocks, uh, which can actually occur at any moment. Looks what what is happening to to Belarus right now. Um, to to to. Uh, of course, I I wish all the best for uh, Belarusian people, but uh, the the situation in Belarus and the sections involved right now. Um, can cause a lot of people to move to Poland, and this already could create uh, a problem in managing migration. So um, let's wait and see, but I think it's inevitable at some point to adopt a common strategy for Europe, especially that once you are in, you, uh, you, are, you are in, and mobility within Europe is extremely easy. So um, uh, it has to be, uh, we have to adopt uh, a common migration policy uh, uh, sooner or later. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, I don't see any other questions. So, and our time is unfortunately also finishing. We are running out of time. So once again, uh, many thanks to Nicola and Jan for a fantastic presentation, a super interesting paper. Good luck with, uh, with the last, um, uh, in, the, in the process of, uh, of submitting it. And, uh, and, um, and we are uh, already inviting you to our next seminar, which will take place in the second half of June and it will be devoted um, to the recent publication of a book by um, Alexandra grzmar Kozowska, which is on the uh, theory of anchoring, which was published by University of Bristol uh, last year. And we'll, we'll, um, Ola will present the book and we'll, uh, together with other colleagues, will comment on parts of the book. We'll have a um, seminar devoted to the book. You are highly welcomed. Um, so once again, many thanks uh, for being with us today and, and hear you and see you soon. Thanks a lot for inviting us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks.